Well, thank you and greetings from the family up north. You know, uh, we have joked in the past that our, our neighbors uh, might start with the initials SC, uh, Santa Claus, um, because we are so far north for most people. Um, but I have an update for you guys uh, that I would just like to share with you. Um, we have been seeing people's lives transformed um, at Eden North. Everything from just the region having so much brokenness for different reasons, be it brokenness from church hurt, um, brokenness in relationship, people just being far from God in general, and people coming home, finding community, finding the love of Jesus in a community of believers. And we're seeing testimonies come out of it. I mean, we're seeing people's uh, bodies restored as well. We've seen, I've been hearing uh, testimonies of people that have had cancer that the doctors are going, we don't know what to do. Like we, we actually, we're just gonna start reducing your chemotherapy because we don't know really what's happening because this isn't normal. Um, so there's some really cool testimonies that we're seeing take place up north. Um, but I am asking that you would agree with me in prayer because we are going to be uh, reaching out to the community more and more where we are going to be the hands and feet of Jesus, very present. Um, some ways that we're gonna be involved is actually a community, community garden um, that is actually providing food for a food bank in Arlington. We are also gonna be partnering with another food, food distribution uh, service that is just reaching, it's literally reaching 1,500 plus people every single month um, taking care of families. Um, this same ministry has actually moved, I think, I wanna say it was around 500,000 pounds of food um, in just one year. Um, so we are excited that we get to be a part of this, serving the community, reaching people, and just being able to share the love of Jesus with people who desperately need a touch from God. So if you could be praying for people to be involved in this, also resources as we begin to be more and more involved because there's gonna be needs. We are going to need to be able to pour into people's lives, take care of some tangible things for them, and also pray for dirt for Eden North. When I say dirt, we're asking that you pray for a property for us where we aren't just renting, but we are actually becoming landlords because there is an authority that is given to us as we take a permanent residence in our region because you're taking ground, literally. And then we're just believing that we're going to even be given a facility. So if you would just agree with me as we are moving that direction, um, you know, we are about 70 strong on a Sunday night and we have about 100 to 104, or, or sorry, 120 to 140 people who call Eden North their home church. And for a church that is three months old, that is amazing. I've, I have some people that are even on my own team, on my eldership, um, that they have been a part of mo many, many church plants and new campuses. And they're like, we've never been a part of one that has been established so quickly and have such deep roots. Um, so we are just so excited for what God is doing. Um, we really appreciate all the prayer that you guys can just turn toward us. Um, we believe that God is gonna continue to just flourish what's happening at Eden North. And so that is the update and it is worth celebrating. We, we love you guys and we just really appreciate the support that we have gotten from you. With that, I would like to pray just over the message today. Um, it is on the glory of the Lord, so I want to invite him into this place. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come before you. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit to come and move. Lord, to be made manifest in this place. Lord, that you would touch people's bodies, their minds, their souls, Lord, that they would begin to step into a new place of freedom and seeing you for who you truly are. Lord, we surrender this moment to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as I mentioned, today we're speaking on the topic of glory uh, with Pastor Darren's blessing. Um, of course, we, he just said, you know, just speak whatever God is laying on your heart. 
And we've been on the series of the glory uh, at Eden North. And I know that you guys have been on that series as well on Sunday nights. But I think it's so important for us to get some maybe misconceptions out of the way about what the glory is, what it isn't, and how do we steward it. So what is glory? It is not the trophy that a marathon runner wins. Not with God, it isn't. It is actually who he is. It is the purity, it is the holiness, it is his essence, it is his presence. That when we come into a place where we, ha we are having an interaction with God, we actually don't know what could take place because he is a limitless God. His glory made manifest transforms people and things in an instant. It doesn't, he is not restricted to time, material, to anything that we are limited by. So, the glory is the presence of the Lord. Wherever he is, is un, it's unpredictable in our eyes because he is the God that has no limitation. Not unpredictable in a bad way. But 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, the, nat the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. One of the things we have to get out of the way is processing the glory of the Lord from an intellectual standpoint. Because we try to wrap our minds around this God who cannot be processed by my mind. He is limitless. He created everything by his word. Does that make sense to anyone? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Don't know what that was, but it doesn't make sense to me because he is the God that is outside of my comprehension. And he is outside of anyone's comprehension in this room, watching online. You can't, you can't get over the glory of the Lord. You can't. It's not possible. Glory can't be explained using natural reasoning because he isn't natural. He is supernatural. Amen. He is extraordinary and he is far and above. Amen. He's the God of yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He is the Lord God Almighty. We're talking about, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. I, I don't even know how to summarize it other than this is him who is worthy that has conquered all. If we re return to the Garden of Eden because we love to go back to Eden, it's in the name, but if we go back to that place, we realize that God had made Adam and Eve, his son and his daughter, in his image and in his likeness. I believe that when he said in his image and in his likeness, he also placed, placed a level of his glory on them. It wasn't their glory, but it was a part of him that rested on him or on them. And when they stepped into a place of sin, that glory could no longer coexist in their existence. That's why they were made aware of their sin, made aware of shame, because a part of who God had made them to be by experience no longer could be. It wasn't the original design was no longer there. And that's what God has been wanting us to get back to. It's not that we are meant to just have glory like rest on us. It is meant to actually come out from us because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit that is the light of Jesus that is coming from the inside and making its way out. This, this message is not about us and our condition and, and where we're coming from, but I think it's important for us to understand that the glory of the Lord is meant to rest on his sons and his daughters. That as we are come into his presence, that we are carriers. We, are, we become the thing that can hold his glory. It is not ours, but we can hold it. And the glory of the Lord made manifest does extremely amazing things. 
I'm going to share my testimony of God touching me, no person laying hands on me. I also have another testimony that, that ties into that. But I think it's so important that we know that we don't need a man or a woman to lay hands on us necessarily to see miraculous things take place in our lives. Second Corinthians four, five and six says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So where do we find glory? We find it by setting our gaze upon the face of Jesus. That we don't, we can't go to the manifestation of the Lord and say that is glory. The glory is locking eyes with Jesus. The one who loved us enough to give himself for us, he was the word that spoke everything into existence. But us being able to make our focus, our focal point of our whole existence about Jesus, that is the most important thing that we could ever do with our whole life. Because we can do a lot of things on our own power. But it's not really going to equate to much of anything if it doesn't point to him at the end of everything. That's what this, the whole book is about. From Genesis through Revelation, I know that we've been in the series on Revelation and it is all about pointing to Jesus, the conquering king. But we just have to make every single aspect of our life and our existence about him. About Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus was the one who came and he fulfilled what we could not on our own. So from this, we see that the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord is in him. He is our source. We can't go to other sources to find our answers. I know that in, in our time, it is so easy to go, man, I can go to the doctor and they'll write me a prescription and that'll fix my problem. I am not against going to a doctor, but if your belief in your doctor outweighs your belief in your faith in Jesus, there is a problem. And we just have to fix it. Just fix your eyes on Jesus because he is the author and perfecter. He is the beginning and the end. He is our everything. But when we experience the glory of the Lord, our lives can't help but be changed. Just one moment with God and everything can change. A scriptural illustration of this is the life of Saul or Paul. Because in an instant, his life changed. I'm going to read Acts 9, 1 through 8. And it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, the way was the title of the Christians. They, they were followers of the way men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So a little context here for maybe those who don't know who Saul was. Saul was really, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader, and he felt his call was to essentially eradicate the Christians. And he wasn't just the guy who was going to arrest people and put them in prison to deliver them. 
he actively had a part in the stoning of Stephen in Acts 6. So he was actually an executioner in a way as well. So Christians were very afraid of their interactions with this man. That's why I think that eventually he had to change his name to Paul. It doesn't really say why his name changed. Scripture doesn't say that. But I believe that there was such a fear from Christians that they, when they heard the name Saul, they were afraid. You can actually see it in just verses past what we just read, where a man was so reluctant to help Jesus, or help Jesus, help Saul because of the fear. But Jesus had met Saul and he was speaking to him. He was giving him a vision, even in that moment. But it is in one moment of experiencing the glory of the Lord that your whole life can change. That the trajectory of where you're going completely turns around. That in a lot of ways, the glory of the Lord will bring you to a place of repentance because you'll realize that you've been going the wrong direction. And he'll do that even just for, for us as believers. Sometimes he'll go, course correct. That moment where I spoke that to you, that's bringing you right back to me. You've been a little distracted. Recently, I actually had to eliminate, and I've, I've had conversations with people, I had to eliminate some distractions in my life. They weren't bad things, but they weren't the things that mattered. And sometimes that's what God is doing in us. He's going, this is good, but I have something better for you. And what he did with, with Saul was that he knocked him off his high horse. And I, and I know that's, I don't know that he was riding a horse or a donkey or if he was on his feet, but he humbled him. He gave him perspective of what he was truly doing and how he was spending his life. And he revealed himself through the glory of the Lord. He blinded him. He blinded him so that he could reveal his identity to him. That it would eliminate his own ability to count on himself because he was very qualified in the natural sense of things. And he just made him rely on Jesus alone. So where do we find the glory of the Lord? It is locking eyes with Jesus. It is in his face, in his face alone. It is, he is our source. If we find another source that isn't him, we've, we've missed it. Sometimes we can, we can get distracted by the manifestation. I, this is sometimes hard for us to wrap our minds around, but we can be distracted by the manifestation of the presence. We can be going after, man, I want to fall down today. Or I want to experience this thing. But ultimately what matters is that we're just pursuing Jesus. Those things will happen as we're following Jesus. We'll see signs and wonders, the miraculous at work in our lives if we just pursue Jesus. Yes, ask for gifts. Ask for the gift of prophecy. Ask for those, the gift of tongues, but don't make it your source. Don't make it the thing that you pursue. Make Jesus the only thing that you pursue and set your eyes upon. Amen. Because that's all that matters. Is this making sense to you? Okay. And sometimes we can get distracted. Romans 1, in the context of sin, it, it says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. We can do the exact same thing with a good thing. We can just, for, we can forget the creator in the midst of his creation, in the midst of his manifestation even. So we have to just say, Jesus, be at the center. Be my center. Be the thing that I can build my life off of. I don't want any person in this room to walk out of this place going, man, I've missed it. And I don't want you to feel any sort of 
guilt or shame or anything when you, when you come to that place, I want you to go, God, today is a good day for me to be able to just start over with you. Yeah. I, maybe I've missed it, but I know that you have mercy for me every single day. So don't take it as a weight on yourself, but just say, God, I am putting you at the center of everything that I am doing. The reality of carrying the glory of the Lord is for those who fear and love Jesus. The fear of the Lord is not being afraid of him, being afraid of judgment, as, as sometimes we think of fear in that way. The fear of the Lord is being in awe and having a reverence for him because he is the God of the universe. He created everything. He existed before anything. And we can't wrap our minds around that and don't try. You will probably fry your brain because he, he didn't need anything or anyone before creation, but he desired it. That is the God that we serve. He created everything so that we could have relationship with him because he first wanted a home and he wanted a family. And I think that we were created to be carriers of his presence. Even today, the stories that we see in Acts were not meant to stay there. That in the life of Peter in Acts 5, where he is walking down the street and people are working to the best of their ability to get people to the side of the road where his shadow might even come in contact with these people who need healing who need an encounter with the presence and the glory of the Lord, literally just to come in contact with his shadow. And it says that they were all healed. That it wasn't Peter's ability. It wasn't a gifting within himself. It was the glory of the Lord that was resting on a vessel, an instrument that would just be obedient, to answer the call, to do the work and to just be available. But there is a level of surrender that we have to have where we just say, God, I am available for you and I yield to you. Some of my greatest encounters with the Lord have come from a prayer as simple as, Lord, I yield to you. I yield to you. And sometimes that's all that is needed. Just a place of surrender and saying, God, I've been holding on to all of the things that I really don't need to be holding on to. What I have been given is a blessing, but God, if you want me to, I will lay it down because you are worth everything that I could ever give to you. You're not just worthy of my lip service when I sing a song. You are worthy of everything that I am. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And when it says, let your light shine, it means let his light light shine. The light that was deposited in each of us, let that light come out. It isn't meant to be hidden. It's meant for the world to encounter the glory of the Lord. That as we make ourselves available and go, that he would be made known to people. I know that sometimes it can be like, man, I, I don't feel very confident about just going up to strangers and talking with them. But we actually live in a culture. This is one of the first times in the United States that we live in a post-Christian culture where there are people who are here now who don't know the name Jesus. There's a generation that doesn't know the name Jesus and they desperately need to hear it. 
because they're floundering because they don't have hope. They see the tensions of the world around us and, and they don't realize that there is a person that they can turn to that loved them so much to give his life for them. They, they don't know. I don't like that term, post-Christian. But the reality is, is that we, we need people to know about Jesus and it means that we have to share about him. Yes, love on people, show them kindness, but always be ready and eager to share the hope that is within you. Always be, I want you to feel equipped to share that hope, no matter what the situation. A little coaching on sharing the, the hope of Jesus is, hey, how is your day going? If they say, you know, I'm, today has been a little bit of a rough day. That's an open door. That is an open door for you to say, you know what? I, I would just really like to pray with you. Are, are you okay with that? And from there, you have a moment to share the love of Jesus. But it's, it's so simple. And sometimes they're gonna reject you. The Father loves you and he doesn't reject you, so it doesn't matter. The rejection that you face, Jesus in you is being persecuted just as much, if not more, than you. He is. Because even when he had that encounter with Saul on the road to Damascus, he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. It was Jesus on the inside of his disciples that were being persecuted. That's just a little side note. But let your light shine does not mean the light that you have on your own. What I'm saying is the light of Jesus that was within you is shining. Let it shine. We could sing that whole song if we wanted to. <laughs> but we ourselves do not provide solutions that are going to cause an eternal outcome that is good. We can do things for people and we can love on them and we can care for them. But what we really need to do is be able to provide for them a solution that is going to change their whole being from the inside out. And that light is only found in Jesus. And I wanna give you guys some examples of the glory of the Lord on display and it will sound like a list because it is a list. But I think it's so important for us to just go, that is God. Genesis 1 and 2, the creation of all of creation, where God made manifest everything through his word. That in six days he created and then he rested. That he just did it out of his goodness, out of a desire for us. And then in in Egypt, the exodus of Israel, where God was saying, there is more for you outside of where you find yourself today. And he did things that to this day, I was just thinking about this recently, he sent 10 plagues just to prove a point that the gods of Egypt had nothing on him, that the creation that they were worshiping was just dust to him. They were worshiping images that were nothing in comparison. And then he parted the Red Sea. That would be a sight to see. I would have loved to see that. He had a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day that followed his children that led the way. The giving of the Ten Commandments were God's goodness passes before Moses, where he is hidden in the cleft of the rock, where he experiences a measure of glory that not many people will ever experience. I don't know if anyone will until we're with him but where it literally made his face shine or glow, however you want to look at it. 
But that is God. He wants to be close to us. He wants us to experience his glory. And then God's presence in the tabernacle. And this is one of the first times where he makes it so evident that he wants to live in our midst. He wants to be with us. He wants to be with his children. He was just saying, I want to be closer to you than you've experienced me in the past. And that is what they did. They built for him a tabernacle that would be at least a temporary sufficient place for him to dwell until he could come and he could live in us. Then we get into the New Testament and the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth, all of the things that led up to this moment that you can see the manifestation of the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm reading through scripture and I'm seeing the angelic encounters and, and the activity and, and it would all be amazing to see. But it was all in preparation for the Messiah to be born. And this was all because he loved us. All because he wanted relationship with us. And then the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. This is one of the, one of the things, and I, and I won't build a doctrine off of it. I was having some conversation with people about this. But if God is the God of yesterday, today, and forever, I, I would love to see or know, and I probably never will, not until I know by being there, but Jesus becomes his true identity in front of Peter, James, and John, where his face shines like the sun, really, in, in the description. And he is all of a sudden, he's in different clothes, and it is his true identity on display. And Jesus is having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. And I'm going, okay, this is a God of yesterday, today, and forever. Is he having a conversation with multiple generations that are alive, or are they in heaven? I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. Was he speaking to Moses and Elijah while they were alive with the disciples at the same time? He's a God that has no limitation. This is conjecture again. But I think that it's so important for us to know that he is not a God with limitation. He knows our past, present, and future because he has already been there. That's the truth. And any limitations that we put on him, they're actually just lies. And we need to break those off. And that's why it was so important for us to address. You cannot wrap your mind around these things if you're thinking from the natural mind. You have to understand it in your spirit. Because God is spirit. And it has to be spiritually discerned. Then the resurrection of Jesus. Next to the creation of everything, this is one of God's greatest dis displays of his glory for us to experience. Because we may not know by what we see, but we get to experience the freedom that it brought us. That one man, who is the son of God, who was God, he died to give us freedom from the curse of sin that we wouldn't have to die a spiritual death. And it was just in one moment that he did that. That is the glory of the Lord. That he bought our freedom in just one moment. And then Pentecost, which was the third step of God getting with us. We just celebrated it this last Sunday it was 1991 years ago that it took place. The reason why I know that is because it was the year I was born and I looked it up. But the thing is, is that this is God saying, I can't get close enough to you by meeting you in a temple. I need to be in you and on you, all around you. I don't want this distance between us. 
And this was a full invitation to say, I want to dwell in you. And I want you to know me. I want you to have the mind of Christ. I want your mind to be renewed and become more and more and more like me. And the last one was the conversion of Saul to Paul. I have, I have a, a testimony to share with you that I would like you to just be patient because I'm going to be just vulnerable because I was very judgmental. It was about six years ago. I was standing at the back of a room in a healing service and I was looking around and I was seeing all these people receiving healing and I was going, this person I don't think is getting healed. This person I don't know and this person I think so. But I was judging. I was being very, I had a religious spirit about how I was looking at the room. It wasn't discernment. There is a difference between discernment and just judging. And for me, I'll own up to the fact that I was judging and I had been that way for a long time. And God in that moment spoke to me and said, how dare you judge what other people are experiencing? And in that moment, it broke it off of me. I know that God may speak to you differently. He has to speak pretty strongly to me because sometimes I can be stubborn, quietly stubborn. <laughs> but God, he broke that religious thing off of me and I began to realize, God, I am not the judge. You are the judge and you are also the healer. So I'm not, I'm gonna get out of the way. So from when I was 16 to 26, I had this issue going on. It's TMJD, it's Temporal Mandibular Joint Disorder, where I was told many times that I was gonna have to have a, at least one, if not more, procedures to fix what was happening in my jaw. To the point where I was waking up in the middle of the night on a regular basis just before this service with lockjaw. If you have never experienced it, I don't wish it on anyone. I know that people in this room have experienced a lot worse things. But for me in that moment, I was going, well, I, I've been living with this thing for 10 years now. And it's just progressively gotten worse and I'll probably have to have a procedure. But out of the goodness of God, when the person who was speaking, I don't know who it was, and it doesn't ultimately matter, they just said, hey, if you feel like maybe God touched your body in some way, that he healed you somehow, would you just exercise the thing that maybe was causing you pain before? And just to kind of play along, I just, I opened my mouth. And that for the first time, I was able to open my mouth without cracks and pain. It wasn't because someone came up to me and laid hands on me. It was because the glory of the Lord sometimes will show up and you don't even perceive it. When, when Saul on the road to Damascus had his encounter with Jesus, he was blinded by the glory of the Lord and he was having a conversation with Jesus. The men around him only heard a voice. They didn't see anyone. So sometimes we don't know what people are experiencing. The glory of the Lord may be manifesting in someone's life that you aren't aware of. For me, I didn't have anyone touch me. I didn't even get goosebumps. It was just the Lord showed up and he did what he does. And I, and I didn't even give him permission. <laughs> he just did it. You know what's even crazier is that I just found out, it was a week ago I found out. For those of you who know Lisa Lancaster's testimony, where she had been given a doctor's note saying, for these many reasons, you're going to die. It was literally her death note. If you haven't heard her testimony, I encourage you, track her down, listen to it somewhere. But I didn't know it 
she was sitting 10 to 12 feet from me in the same service and that was where she was healed. Literally death to life and no one laid a hand on her, no one laid a hand on me. It was if Jesus walked in the room unbeknownst to us and just said, be healed. That is, that's the glory of the Lord made manifest. That sometimes we aren't aware of it. Don't try to judge it. Don't try to put him in a box because he is going to blow open any limitations that you have placed on him. And that was the moment where I got to experience just a small glimpse of the glory of God. But we're not meant to just experience it in just these little bursts. We're actually meant to experience it on a daily basis. And he wants to be in our midst, be on us and work through us. And I wanna give an invitation for anyone in the room. If you need a physical healing, financial breakthrough or relational breakthrough, I just ask that you would stand. Again, that is physical, financial, relational. Okay, look around this room. There is a lot of opportunity for testimony because every person that's standing in this room, you are a potential testimony of Jesus's goodness right now. And I'm gonna ask that our ministry team just come forward right now because I'm gonna request that you, as people who have stood up needing breakthrough, that you would come forward and we're gonna just pray for every single person standing in this place. Because I believe that God has breakthrough for you today and that you're going to experience the glory of the Lord. It isn't because of what's been shared today, it is because of who he is. So if you would just come forward, if you're standing, I know that it's gonna take a few minutes to get to you in prayer, but God can touch you like he touched me, where we may not even understand what is happening. For those of you who are still seated in the room, I just would ask that you just pray. You can worship, but pray for the people to experience a move of God where the glory is poured out over them. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we get to come into your presence and encounter the glory of the Lord, that you are the Lord of glory. Lord, that as we come and we're just obedient to respond, Lord, I pray that you would touch people's bodies, their finances and the relationships, Lord, that we would be a people who are so free. Lord, I pray for grace and Lord, I pray that you would be glorified through everything that has taken place today. Lord, we love you. Lord, we worship you in Jesus' name. Just continue to pray for people, even if you're just seated in the rows, in the aisle, but just believing that people will receive the breakthrough that they're looking for.